how we can improve the uh, life, the economic perspective, cultural perspective, social perspectives of communities by doing archaeology with them. Most of you, many of the master students know that legislation in Italy is not so good, beneficial to these participatory activities, but we'll see, I think, different examples on uh, different countries to understand what could be done and what not. Uh, without saying anything else, I will invite uh, Alexa, remember all of you, to present somebody in the next day, so look how she does it. And she's going to present uh, our uh, invited guest today and then to leave if there is any, I hope, uh, question uh, after the paper, she's going to leave also the discussion. Okay. So uh, today we have as a guest uh, Peter Gould. He started his career in uh, economics. He worked uh, in uh, this area for many years, uh, including uh, his uh, senior staff role at the President's Council of Economics Advisors. So he has uh, many experiences uh, in the economic area. He had uh, an early interest in economic development, uh, archaeology and heritage that led him to his master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania in 2010. Uh, at, in Global Studies and then uh, at his uh, PhD in uh, 2014 uh, at the University College London in Archaeology, so at the Institute of uh, Archaeology. Um, he is involved in uh, many organizations and uh, in many projects, for example is a uh, partner of the Dick Ventures LTD, that is a crowdfunded based uh, commercial archaeology firm in uh, the UK. And uh, he has uh, many experience, personal experiences uh, in uh, the governance uh, of um, uh, in the governance of uh, communities project, uh, including uh, in um, including his role as chairman at Pennsylvania Zoo and uh, Mann Institute of Music. Uh, he decided to focus uh, his uh, studies on the um, cultural uh, economics and on uh, the relationship between uh, archaeology practice. Uh, and uh, um, cultural heritage uh, management for the uh, economics development. He's also studying the governance of the community-based uh, projects uh, that wants to improve the economical growth of, uh, of a local uh, community through their uh, heritage resources. He had studies, uh, uh, he has studied uh, in um, these kinds of projects and this kind of organization in uh, Brazil, in Peru, Ireland and Italy from which he made his most uh, recent publication that is uh, in 2018 that is empowering communities uh, through uh, archaeology and heritage. So in uh, these uh, two days of uh, conferences today and tomorrow that are organized by our professor Alexandra Chavarria he will talk to us uh, about uh, uh, the relationship between uh, archaeology, cultural heritage and economics uh, and how to develop uh, uh, an economical growth uh, of uh, local communities through these subjects. So please welcome Peter Gould. Thank you. Um, it's kind of scary how much you can find out about me on the internet. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm glad to be here. I'm lovely to see such a big crowd. Um, what we're going to do in the next two days is introduce you to an element of public archaeology. Public archaeology is sort of outside the mainstream of archaeology and I'm going to take you outside the mainstream of the mainstream. Um, uh, as, uh, as Alexis said, my background is in economics and in business um, and I came to this world uh, of archaeology relatively late in life, um, but I have spent two decades working with community organizations in, uh, in the Philadelphia area and am, uh, uh, have had a lifelong interest in economic development. So what I'm trying to bring together here for you is sort of 30 or 40 years of economics, 20 years of community work, and 10 or 15 years now of cultural heritage. Um, what we're going to do in these two days, today I want to introduce you to some of the fundamental concepts in economics and how those apply in the world of cultural heritage. And tomorrow we're going to talk about 
the relationship of archaeology and heritage to communities, how one organizes community projects, how one can uh, use archaeology for economic benefit, and what some of the pitfalls are if it, if it isn't done right. So that's kind of the trajectory of the two days. That's right. I want to start with the perspective that economics in much of the world of archaeology and cultural heritage is to some degree a dirty word. Um, there are, there is uh, in the in the profession uh, what my friend Catherine LaFrance Samuels has labeled a uh, sort of a, a reflexive antipathy to anything having to do with capitalism and business and that sort of thing. One of the reasons is that while we like to enjoy heritage from the perspective of a pristine site monument, in this case the Trevi Fountain, um, what lots of heritage specialists see are the Roman helmets, the Pope Francis bobblehead dolls, and the sort of thing that debases and, and from our sort of perspective in the field, you know, undermines the integrity and value of what we regard as a very important legacy of humanity. So archaeologists tend not to like the business side of what we're doing. I want to explain to you today why that is not the way we should think about economics and business. Now, what's the point of economics? And, and I want to spend a few minutes just talking about what the point of this is and why it matters to you. Economists are focused on scarce resources. If something is super abundant, if there's enough of it for everybody, economists, generally speaking, don't care about it. If there's not enough, you suddenly have a major problem in, in life. That is, how much of it should you make? Who should get it? How are you going to distribute it? How are you going to make the outcome fair? The problem of the creation of economic products, we'll get to what those are in a minute, and their production and distribution and allocation is a fundamental issue that it exists whether you're talking about the construction of an Apple computer or how do you decide among cultural sites, all of which may need protection, but we're not able to protect them. So the first thing that economists care about is scarcity. And then once they decide that we have something scarce, they have a series of sort of core concerns. One is whatever we're going to do effective. If we have a policy to protect a site, if we want to do something uh, in regard to a piece of cultural heritage, does it work? Does it achieve the goals that are laid out for it? I have argued in other places, one of the things public archaeology isn't very good at is articulating its goals and measuring whether it does it well. But economists worry about this all the time. The next thing what they want to know is, is it efficient? If we have something that works, do we do it with the least cost, the least amount of resources used uh, that is possible? Or is there a cheaper, better way to achieve our goal? So is it effective? Does it work? Is it efficient? Is the cost as low as it can be? Who pays for it? The question of incidents is a very important issue in society. If we are subsidizing cultural activities, if the government is subsidizing activities, somebody is paying for that, generally speaking, taxpayers, and somebody is consuming it, may not be taxpayers, may not be the same taxpayers. So who pays and who benefits become a very important economic question. And then there's really a political question that underlies that economic question, which is, is the answer to who pays and who benefits fair? So, and fair is a political judgment, not an economic judgment, but it's important to how you structure policies, many of, particularly in an area like ours. So, five points in economics. Is the resource scarce? Do we have policies that are effective? Is what we're doing efficient? What's the incidence of whatever we're doing? And is it equitable? Now, what makes all this relevant 
Is it the real scarce resource today in cultural heritage is money. Around the world, attitudes towards spending on things like cultural heritage uh, are changing very rapidly. Governments have been in austerity mode for various reasons, some of them political, like in Britain uh, and uh, in the United States, some of them economic, like in Italy, um, where for one reason or another, governments have said, we just can't spend as much as we used to. We don't want to spend as much as we have been spending. So immediately there's now more demand for money than there is money. And we're faced with the question of who should get the money and how. That partly reflects shifting role views of what government should do. I think historically in much of Europe, the view was the government should take care of things like cultural heritage. That view is shifting. It's taking into account more private sector activity, whether it's philanthropy or private company subsidies like Todd's subsidy for the repair of the Colosseum, or taking into account um, um, partnerships with, with, between public and private entities. We'll talk a bit about those, but the point is that um, these attitudes towards who should play what role imply that not only is government making decisions about which resources should be funded where, and should it go to heritage, or should it go to social services, or should it go to tax reductions, but those private entities that are getting involved have to make decisions about how much money they want to devote to heritage as opposed to something else. Finally, particularly in the United States, to a lesser degree in, um, in Britain, and sort of in its earliest stages in Italy, um, there's this question of philanthropy. That is, you know, are people who have lots of money prepared to give it away to support some activity. In the United States, that's the way we fund most social programs, particularly things in the cultural arena. It's done with money that's donated. Britain does substan a substantial amount of that and has been actively pushing their museum sector in that direction. Italy has had some very interesting experiences, like Todd's uh, subsidy, you know, paying for the for the um, for the conservation of the uh, Colosseum and the huge public uproar that came around that, the Fendi, the uproar around Fendi's redoing the uh, Mussolini building in, uh, in EUR. And so on the one hand, you've had some very public uh, consternation about what role the private sector should pay in heritage. But at the same time, um, you have increasing numbers of private museums, foundations that are supporting the arts, things like that all over the country. And so Italy itself is migrating, and now we're beginning to see in the, in the attempts to, to reform places like Herculaneum and Pompeii and the National Museums, a change in policy here that's beginning, it's a first step toward at least where Britain has headed, if not where the United States is headed. So there are lots of actors involved today in cultural heritage, even in a country like Italy, which was historically so government dominated, all of whom have different interests and different concerns about where money should go in heritage and who should pay for it. So money becomes the thing that binds this whole conversation together in the archeology span world. Question is, why should you care? You all want to study archeology span and history and stuff like that. Um, the answer is you're gonna end up either working for the government in this con changing context I just described, or you're gonna end up perhaps working in a, in a university doing archeological research, or you're gonna end up working for a commercial archeology span business, um, which is the primary employer of archeologists span in much of the world. In all of those places, these decisions about money are gonna be made every day. And they're not gonna be made by people who are thinking about what's in the ground. They're gonna be made by people who are thinking about money. They're gonna be made by business people and people who think like economists, even if they're archeologists or historians. So if you're gonna be in those places, 
The reason we're starting to teach this kind of stuff is you really need to at least understand the thought process and the language and a bit of the theory so that if you're in a meeting where somebody's trying to make an economic decision about something that affects what you're doing, you're able to track it and participate in it and not just have it blow past you. Because you cannot avoid being in economic conversations in, the fu in archaeology in the future anywhere in the world. That's why we're doing this. Now, what I want to do today is walk you through some of the fundamentals of economics to make sure you can, you can speak to how um, economics works, what, how the theory works, what the core issues are, um, particularly as they affect cultural heritage, and then talk a bit about the role of cultural heritage uh, in the economy from various perspectives, some of which we'll pick up in more detail tomorrow. So we're going to talk about um, just what is an economy, how do, how do economies manage this problem of scarcity. We're going to talk about uh, markets, what they are, how they work. Um, then we're going to talk about market failure, which is a core concept in cultural heritage, because most of what we deal with in our world are activities and um, uh, that, that for which markets do not exist and for which markets do not work. Um, we're going to talk about the role of government, we're going to talk about how decisions are made, and we're going to talk about a core problem in, in archaeology and heritage going into the future, which is trying to figure out what the value of archaeology is. How do we measure the benefits of what we're doing so we can help make decisions right? And then we're going to have look at heritage in various guises in the economy. So, first question, what's an economy? This is a picture of uh, the Asociación Inquiasta in, uh, in Rakhchi, Peru. It is a community project of the residents of this village, which was one of the places I, I lived for a long time and studied for my PhD. Um, um, we will get to get into more detail about it um, tomorrow, but what um, what I want you to see is um, how something as small as uh, a table full of essentially tourist tchotchke in the middle of Peru um, can, can help you think about what an economy is. Um, the first thing, the definition of an economy, again, it's all in the notes, so please do look at this. Um, <laughs> the definition of an economy is, quote, a system of activity connected with the production, trade, cons and consumption of goods and services in a region, a country, or another not geographic area. So goods, goods are the tchotchke on the table. Goods are physical things. Services are anything else that is transacted in economic life that are not tangible. So the service here is the retail activity. When you go into a shop, you are buying a good from a service establishment. If you buy an insurance policy, you're not actually buying a thing, you're buying a service. You're buying a commitment that if you break your leg, the insurance company will pay for to get fixed. Or if you smash up your car, it will pay to get the car fixed. Services are ubiquitous. It's the largest um, activity uh, in the economy in the world. The largest sector of the service economy is the tourism sector. And the most important driver of the tourism sector is cultural heritage. So one of the direct linkages between this slide and tomorrow's lecture is that cultural heritage is the driver of the largest service sector in the world economy. First thing. But what you see here is a small activity in a small village in the economy of Rakhchi, Peru. Rakhchi has its own economy. But Rakhchi's economy is part of the Peruvian economy, a larger geographic area in the definition. And this activity is part of the tourist economy. 
which is a global phenomenon. Doesn't just cover one geography or another. So economies can be very narrow in concept, they can be very broad, and you always have to be careful when you are thinking about the role of something in an economy to be clear to yourself, well, what economy am I talking about? But the core issue is whenever you have an economy, what's really going on is an exchange of usually money, sometimes it's a barter, for goods and services. And there are lots of decisions that have to be made in this process. The first decision is, what are we going to make, right? Who decides what to make? Second question is, how much of it should we make? The third question is, you know, how should we physically distribute it or offer a service to people? Um, there are, if you think about the problem of designing and building an Apple computer and then getting it, um, getting all the parts assembled from all over the world, put together and then into a store and then into your hands, you can begin to get a sense of how many decisions have to be made to produce a thing. If you think about a tourist coming to Rome, think about all the things you have to do to get from Dubuque, Iowa to Rome and home and have a good experience. How do those decisions get made? Well, in the global sense, you can think of two broad models. There's what are called command economies, which was the old Soviet model, was the old Chinese model. Other than the North Koreans, not, people, not many people do this anymore, but it, it illustrates the extreme of one end of that conversation, which is the government decides. In the old days in the Soviet Union, there was a thing called Das Plan, and Das Plan was this big giant econometric model that decided how much of everything needed to be made in order to have a perfectly balanced economy. And then they would issue quotas to factories that said you should make you know, so many notebooks, you should make so many pens, you should make so many computers. As we all know it didn't work very well. But uh, that's, that's one end of the spectrum. The other end is a pure market economy where the market figures out through what Adam Smith called the invisible hand how much should be made and how much should not and who should get it and how it's distributed. So markets, markets are often in our world a dirty word. Well, I don't want to get the market in the middle of this. But let's think about what markets are capable of doing when they work right. The idea behind a market is, is in some sense very simple. First, it is, the assumption is that you as a consumer know what you want. And you as a consumer, when you go into the marketplace, whether it's to, to buy a shirt or to buy a car or to take a trip to the beach or a trip to Rome to see a site, um, you know what you want. And in the conventional models, the assumption is you are doing what you were doing in order to maximize what economists call your utility. If you were all at University College London, I would tell you all about how Jeremy Bentham, who founded University College London, invented this concept. That's because Jeremy Bentham sits in Uni University College London in a, in a box. When he died, he has to be stuffed and mounted and kept on display. So it's great fun at UCL to talk about utilitarians because the founder of it is actually around the corner in a box. Um, the idea of utility in economics is simply that you are motivated by essentially a personal hedonistic desire to make yourself as happy as you can. In theory, that's what drives your behavior. On the other side, in the theory, the supplier of whatever you're consuming, the notebook, the pen, the shirt, the car, the archeological site, is driven to maximize profit. All that a, um, that a business person should care about 
in the economic model is maximizing profit. And then what happens when this hedonistic utility maximizing consumer meets this greedy uh, profit maximizing business person is in the market, they are A, making individual decisions about what they want to buy. B, there are lots of people out there trying to satisfy you as a consumer, and you as a consumer, and you as a consumer. And that competition does two things. One, it forces customer, it forces suppliers, companies, to produce what you want. So, you know, if, if um, Francesca's buying a blue dress, and there are no blue dresses on offer, but she goes in and says, I want a blue dress, well, somebody may make a blue dress. On the other hand, if there's someone who wants some green striped dresses with purple flowers on them, and nobody's buying them, they're going to stop making them. So the whole underlying concept in economics is that consumers are the sovereign. You, the consumer, are the one who decides what is made and how much it costs. Because if it costs too much, you're not going to buy it, and people will stop making it. If it's very inexpensive, it may not be very profitable, and so companies may stop making it until the price goes up. Competition among companies will drive the most efficient solution to satisfy what you as a consumer want. So the whole theory of economics says that what markets do is they bring together multiple sellers. And it might be, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, an outdoor market, like the one around the corner that we walked through a few minutes ago, uh, where there's lots of people selling oranges. And you're going to go around and figure out which orange is the best and which one's the cheapest. You know, or which, which, you know, which orange seller is a family friend and you're going to buy it from them. Or it might be a big department store where there are going to be 15 different brands of coffee on the shelf and you're going to go in and decide which one you want and which ones you don't. And the ones you all collectively don't want go away eventually. Or it can even be something that's logical like the stock exchange. It's not really, this is all happens these days on computers, right? You know, stocks and bonds get traded um, among buyers and sellers in an electronic marketplace that doesn't really tangibly exist. This is just a, an artifact of it. Any of those things are markets. All of them are driven by the idea that the buyer in the market is the one who, um, who is the important player. Now, in order for this to work, what's important is that there be signals between the buyer and the seller that are understandable that explain what each should do. The first idea here is that individuals respond to incentives. An incentive is anything that motivates your behavior. Incentives can be tangible. Um, they, can be, they can be psychological. You can buy from your the, 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 the fruit vendor who's the family friend. Uh, they can be um, um, financial. Um, I can pay you to do something. Um, but whatever the reason is that we're motivating you to do something, an incentive is at the core of how people behave. And one of the things economists believe fundamentally is that um, as people respond to incentives, companies respond to incentives, bureaucrats respond to incentives, Incentives may not be financial. Um, there's a large body of study in economics around the behavior of bureaucracies, which could be boiled down to sometimes it's not how much you get paid, because you kind of max out how much you get paid. It's about power. Right? Power can be a big incentive. So economists would look at a power struggle in a bureaucracy over who got control of how much of the, uh, of the superintendenza, and they would see that as a battle for you know, being driven by the incentive in the bureaucracy, which is to have power over as much as you can have. The issue with respect to markets is that you're looking for a simple way to communicate 
a very complex set of ideas between consumers and producers. And it turns out the simplest way to communicate that and create incentives is the price. Just think about what a price really is. If, uh, if your iPhone costs, uh, I don't know if it once cost, a thousand, thousand euros or something like that these days, um, um, what's embedded in that thousand euros is actually a phenomenal amount of information. What's embedded in that from the producer side is I know how much it costs. All the, all the costs to put this thing together, I've got them all bundled up and it's all built into my cost structure. I have embedded in my price the profit I want to make. And I've got embedded in my price, if I'm Apple, some notion of how much you're willing to overpay for an iPhone. Either because you think they're cool to have, or like my wife, you've discovered you're locked into their, uh, their, their messenger channel and it's so hard to get out and give up and keep buying iPhones. Um, so they've got a whole bunch of interesting ideas baked into how they price this. You as a consumer coming to it saying, I want a certain size, I want a certain weight, I want it to have certain functions, use certain apps, I want it to look nice, you know, I don't want it to break, I want, you know, I've got a whole bunch of criteria, which if you went to market and what you said was, here's my list of criteria for a phone, and the supplier said, well, here's my cost build up and all this kind of stuff, you wouldn't really know how to sort it out. But if the answer is, 1200 bucks. If you like it and it's got what you need, you pay 1200 bucks. If it doesn't, you don't. So think of all the interesting information that's embedded in the price and all the things you can understand or you don't have to understand if you set the price, if you let the market set the price. So the virtue of markets is they're incredible communications devices. Now, prices, therefore, serve as incentives. To suggest that, okay, do I want to go to the Coliseum today? It's going to cost me 20 bucks or whatever the combo ticket is. Um, um, is it worth that? Or would I rather go out to a big lunch and spend $20 there? The $20 is my sort of symbolic holder of all the value I have for what I want to do today. And how I spend that $20 is, is making... Is, is my action in the market of activities to do today at Rome um, uh, that is, is at the, the core of how resources get allocated between, if you will, in that example, heritage sites and restaurants. So the market has this incredible capacity to make lots of decisions, decide who gets what, how much is produced, how it's distributed, are you going to buy stuff from a discount store? You're going to buy the same thing from, from a, a high price store. All those decisions get made without anybody talking to anybody because all of the information is packed into a price. You're motivated by incentives and you're making your decisions based on whether that price is consistent with the amount of your utility you're getting from consuming the good. Now, where does this have to do with, with heritage? Well, let me, let me let me give you a concrete, adverse example. There's a concept in economics called um, elasticity. That is, how much, how much do people's behavior change, or any kind of behavior change, if there's a change in something else? Technically, it's the percentage change in one thing over the percentage change in another. One that's most relevant most of the time is the elasticity of demand. How much does price change? Does a price change lead to a change in demand? How much does demand change when you change price? Often, when you first think about, well, how much should we charge to go to the Coliseum, or go to a museum, or buy an iPhone? Um, there's not a lot of thought given to, well, what else can people do with their money? And how much are they likely to want to spend on us? What's the value of what I'm offering? compared to the other alternatives they have. At the zoo last year, Philadelphia Zoo, where I was chairman for a long time, um, the entry price for general admission is, um, it was around 2250. 
the marketing team decided they could raise the price to $25. Not a big jump. 10%, you know, 5%. It wasn't, wasn't, wasn't a big jump. Um, the consequence was this, you know, 10% increase in price led to something on the order of a 20% drop in attendance. We hit the point where the visitor said, you know what, it's just not worth it to me. I have better things to do with my money. And so the sovereign consumer said, I'm going to go somewhere else and do something else. In that case, there's another zoo in the region, and some of them went to the other zoo. Some of them went to other museums. Some of them just went to the park and bought a more expensive picnic. Um, but either way, where the price point was set had a huge economic impact on the institution. So as you get into circumstances, for example, where you know, what they're wrestling with in Britain these days is they're trying to privatize as much of the cultural heritage sector as they can. This is going to drive decisions about how much should we charge for a membership in English heritage? How much should we charge for admission to a, to a stately home in England? Um, those decisions, if not thought through carefully in the context of the entire market that is involved and what's motivating uh, people to go to the stately home or join English Heritage as opposed to doing anything else with their money can lead to really perverse outcomes. So understanding um, that there are sort of, if you will, ripple effects from economic decisions you have to take into account, even in the heritage sector. You have to worry about your competition. How many museums are there in Rome? If one of them starts charging, you know, are they going to lose business? Or are they going to gain business? Um, what else can people do with their time? If you're in the government and you're making a decision about, you know, how are we going to fund the, uh, the, the programs that in, our, in our community, if you charge for them, you may not get the attendance you want. If you don't charge for them, you have to subsidize them more, and that's going to take money away from other activities in the community. So these economic decisions that, sh that the market solves uh, very easily uh, may not be as easily solved in our world. The reason is the market idea works under a set of very strict assumptions. People have to know a lot about what they want, uh, the market has to be pretty free and fair. There's got to be a, a decent amount of competition um, and, and that sort of thing. The problem in cultural heritage, in particular, is what's known in economics as market failure. Market failure has three different elements that all boil down to the same thing. The market is not going to deliver you the right answer as to how much to make, how to price it, and that sort of thing. What, what the market failure has three commons notion. One, what are called externalities. One of the theories about the price as a great piece of information is that it contains all the information you really need to make a rational decision. However, if there are either external costs that haven't been included in the price, or external benefits that haven't somehow haven't been captured, you're going to misevaluate the good you're working on. So in the days before we had regulation of, uh, of um, uh, any kinds of emissions, Everything that was made in the manufacturing plant was arguably underpriced because society was bearing the cost of the air pollution, the dirty buildings, the sick people. All that kind of stuff that happened from pollution was an externality to the businesses that were causing it. So the government stepped in and regulated them to try to push those costs back in. You know, you got to put a scrubber on. And that's going to raise your costs, which should raise your price, and now people know what it really costs to produce. Things like museums, archaeological sites, things like that, 
have many functions in society. But they are not well articulated from a market point of view. Can I ask you something? Yeah. How much uh, does publicity, branding, uh, appeal, invest in the economic price of things? I mean, something can be not so... Branding, branding is arguably, viewed from this perspective, branding is one of the things that's assumed. It's, it's part of your, part of what drives you to buy, you know, a, a Fendi bag, right? Because it's got Fendi on it. And you get some psychological value out of being able to walk around with a Fendi bag. And that is maximizing your utility, your personal happiness, because you're carrying a bag around. Going to a World Heritage Site lets you, for those, those who have Heritage Site bucket lists, they check off the bucket list. But at least you, when you go home and say, I went to home, if you say you went to a bunch of places nobody ever heard of, and you haven't been to the branded places, the World Heritage Site places, we can feel kind of silly. So the value of the World Heritage brand is, in some sense, it's signaling to people, this is important, you should come see this. There's not a big literature on the question of whether the World Heritage Site's label is worth it, but there is a literature, and it's a complicated literature, where the answer is somewhat ambiguous as to whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. But branding is just, it's one of those elements of your decision, your utility-maximizing decision. Uh, it's also a surprise, because some people go to a place and say, even if it's very expensive, I cannot exactly. go home without secrets. Because, because, because they're... You, their desire to maximize their happiness is they have to go home with that. Okay? I have to go home seeing the Coliseum because I look like an idiot if I went to Rome and never went to the Coliseum. That happens. So, one problem here is, particularly in the cultural heritage area, that gets in the way of markets doing their allocated function is that there are lots of externalities to what we do. Um, museums teach people things. We're not quite sure what. Museums provide social experiences. We're not always quite sure what. We're not even sure in what we do exactly what it is we're selling sometimes. I'll give you an example again from the zoo. We did a study years ago about why grandparent tickets sold so well. Grandparent passes. You could grandfather and grandchild could come. So we went out and asked why. Why, why are these things selling so well? It turns out the grandparents didn't care about the zoo. They weren't even sure they cared about whether they went to a zoo. What they discovered was the zoo was the one place they could take their grandchild where the kid would not keep looking at his iPhone or his iPad and would have a conversation with grandpa. So what we were selling at the zoo was conversation time with Grandpa. It's coincidental there are animals there. If there had been something else that worked, they would have done that too. They just wanted somewhere they could talk to their kid, their grandkid, and not have the kid drift off into a, into a video game. So this is all, these kinds of, that's, I would argue that's, you know, in some sense it got embedded in the demand, but nobody understood it. And if you go out and say, what's the educational value of a museum? Everybody here would probably say museums have educational value. We'll get to this in a bit, but what is it? How do we quantify it? It's not obviously countably embeddable in, in the price of entry to a museum or in the justification for a subsidy. This is becoming a huge issue everywhere because both philanthropists and governments are beginning to ask, why are we doing this stuff? What's the impact? We're going to come back to it. There's a very interesting study done a couple of years ago called Cultural Heritage Counts from Europe, which was a direct response to the European Commission's insistence on people beginning to answer the question, what's the value of what you're doing, which is an attempt to capture the externalities and bring them down to the point where we can understand. We'll come back to that. The other kind of market failure is market power. Pure and simple. If you have um, an organization, an entity that has a 
excessive cloud in the market, you're not going to get competition. That had been a well recognized since Marx and uh, um, you know, characteristic of capitalism that it tends towards monopolies. Um, I have three what I regard as near monopolies up there in the wall, Google, Facebook, and Apple. Um, if you're trapped in the Apple ecosystem, you can't get out. They can charge so much money because it's so hard to move, move your software and move your photos and move your iPhone and all that stuff. So they're extracting what's called a monopoly profit um, because they, you basically can't compete with them very easily if you're trapped in the, in the system. Um, the third cat, and the, the issue with market power is simply that competition doesn't work. There isn't fair competition. The result is prices are too high, supply is lower than it would otherwise be, and you may not get the, the, the other industries, not the technology, the degrees of innovation and, and downward pressure on costs that you would get uh, from a more competitive market. So the Android market, which is more open, has much more competition, much lower prices, many more product offerings than the Apple market, which is essentially a quasi-monopoly. The Superintendenza is arguably a quasi-monopoly. Um, all of the non-profit museums in the United States are arguably a more competitive market when they're facing one another in the same town. The third category of market failure is a public good. A public good can be seen as a, um, a good, a thing, that is something that we all would use and for which I have no ability to prevent you from using it at the same time I do, nor does your use of it interfere with my use. The classic example of a public good was national defense. Adam Smith talked about this. Uh, one of the characteristics of, of public goods is some people don't like to pay for them. They're called free riders. So you have to force people to pay for an army because they all benefit from the army. Uh, they, they need the army. It's going to defend the whole country. Um, I, I can't stop you from being defended. You can't stop me from being defended. Um, my defense doesn't subtract from your defense, but I need to be forced to pay for it because on my, you know, happiness register, it's not going to be at the top of the list, even though I know I need it. This is a problem they call under provision of public goods. The other problem with public goods, which manifests itself in um, classically in what's known as the tragedy of the commons, uh, is that commonly held goods, if everybody is out maximizing their own benefit, will tend to be overconsumed, even destroyed. So think about um, heritage sites, like Machu Picchu, for example, which can be overrun by tourists, because there's no real way to stop them from going out there for any other than the numbers of seats on the train. You know, if they can get to Agua Caliente and get up the hill, they can go there and they're happy to collect the money, but there may be thousands and thousands of people in there at any one time, which at least is degrading the experience. I don't know, any of you ever been to Machu Picchu? Well, um, I've, been there, I've been there at 8 o'clock in the morning until noon, but around 10 o'clock is when the trains come in. At 8 o'clock in the morning, the place is absolutely pristine. It looks like all the pictures. It's amazing. By 10 o'clock, when 7,000 people have come through the gate, they're all crowding on the narrow pathways and stomping on the stones and sitting on the walls and things like that. Your sort of archaeologist heart goes, yeah. right. um, And both the experience is damaged and arguably the physical fabric is damaged. So this problem of public goods and how do you manage them becomes critical. The historic answer um, very much has been um, you know, we'll let the government do it. So you have this problem. If we have lots of aspects of what we do that don't fit the standard market model because they have externalities like museums or because they're public goods, what are we going to do about it? 
in much of the world, not the United States. The answer historically was the government's going to take care of these things. So the government regulates what's done with old buildings, the government regulates um, what's done with archaeological sites, the government regulates how art is managed and conserved, the government owns and operates the museums, the government owns and operates the sites, owns and operates the state and homes in England for the heritage years. Um, this was the way that much of the world did it. The United States model has always been very different. And that goes back, if you read the Tocqueville, it goes back to the founding of the country, you know, something to do with the history of the frontier, people being so far away from the government that if they didn't work together, nobody would do it. And none of them like the government anyway, um, so they didn't want any government. So you have a country that is just chock full of volunteers who give their time and give their money to accomplish a particular task um, because um, that's just how we do it. So you know, the museums, the, the US government owns and operates the Smithsonian Museums in Washington, and that's it. It owns through the National Park Service and operates some of the major um, historical monuments, Independence Hall, and things like that. Some of the others are owned by states, but much of the heritage in the United States is actually managed either in private hands or, if it's really important, predominantly through nonprofit organizations. So you have a real distribution of possible models. The problem with the government model, as I said at the outset, is governments are starting to not want to pay for this. They have too many demands on, on their budgets, they have too many needs to be fulfilled, there are too many people who need health care, too many people who need housing, too many people who need food, too many people who need education, and somehow this problem of um, uh, what do you do about heritage, what do you do about culture, is becoming a real thorn in the side of governments. So the British are as aggressively as they can getting it out of the budget. They're shutting down museums, they're cutting funding, uh, they're privatizing activities um, as fast as they can to begin to look more like the United States. The problem with our model is you don't have the levels of philanthropy anywhere else in the world that you have in the United States by many orders of magnitude, and it's not likely to happen very fast. So there's a world, and, and then in the middle, you have ideas like public-private partnerships. We're going we're to work with the private sector to run our museums, or work with the private sector uh, to, to um, operate our parks. Um, this is a, an area that, in which there's lots of interest, because it feels like the government is doing its job, but not actually requiring spending money. Um, Operationally, they've had lots of issues. Um, there is a, a large literature also on the failure of public-private partnerships. Britain has gone through some very difficult times. But this search, there's a search going on right now for how do we pay for and support cultural heritage and cultural-related activities in a world where money is scarce. And the role of government is changing more or less in real time. Now, any way you look at it, when you are sitting in the, um, in the government, the issue is you have to make decisions. You've got to decide what you're going to spend your money on. And the way economists think about that, most simply, is they want to know, back to our point about effectiveness and efficiency, one, are the benefits of whatever you're going to do greater than the cost to do it? If I'm a businessman and I'm making a computer, if it costs me $1,000 to make it and I can't sell it for more than $900, i am not going to do it anymore because the costs exceed the revenue. If I am looking at a social program, one of my favorite songs, the Board of School, um, 
Should we subsidize up? Um, how many of you here go to up? Wow, good. Woo! Uh, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, opera is arguably a dying art. There are lots of people who think that, you know, um, well, we have to preserve classical music. It's been around for 200 years. It's what people do. But you know what? There's an awful lot of people who don't care. Now, where do you put, where should the government put its money? Well, it should try to figure out where the benefits for society exceed the cost. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so we'll come back to that in the next slide. But this question of what's the value of a cultural activity is at the core. The general principle is I'm not going to do anything that has a greater cost than it does a benefit. You can think about it in two ways. One is, you can just look at some kind of indicators. If I want to compare two government programs in education, I want to do the one that is going to, A, have benefits that I believe are acceptable for the cost, if I can't put dollar signs on it, but I want to do the one that has the most benefits. If I want to get kid, more kids graduated from college, I want to have the program that gets the most kids out per dollar I spend on getting them out. Maybe that means I subsidize universities. In the US, it's tended to mean they want to subsidize uh, distance learning. They're always trying to find the lowest cost way to achieve an objective. Ideally, you'd like to think about it with dollars and cents. I'd like to be able to literally look at the ratio of the dollars of benefit and value to the dollars of cost. That turns out to be, in our world, exceedingly difficult. Because the externalities are hard to quantify and define. The um, uh, output, the product, what is the product of an archaeological site? What, what, what does it do? What is it that has value uh, that you can quantify and compare to its cost? There is no good answer to that question. There are some techniques we'll talk about. But the issue is that if you are an economist, if you are a decision maker in the government, if you are a decision maker in a university and you're saying, you know, which department, you know, am I going to keep open and which one am I not? Um, you're trying to figure out in some sense, notionally or financially, which one is the most valuable to me? Which one has the most students? Do I shoot archaeology or do I shoot biology? Well, I got more students in biology, that's more tuition money. You know, on the other hand, archaeology is not very expensive and biology needs labs, so, you know, but if I'm net ahead in biology, I'll keep biology and shoot archaeology. Those kinds of decisions get made every day in those institutions that allocate the money to activities like this. English heritage, as they have spun themselves off into private sector kinds of activities, is dealing in real time with um, what building should we keep open for how long and when. The English government has been cutting subsidies to local museums for the last 10 years. A friend of mine has been working on a study trying to do a census of museums in Britain, and they've concluded that over the last six or eight years, about 10, there's been a net loss of about 10% of the museums in Britain due to price cuts, due to, due to uh, government subsidy cuts. So decisions have to be made about what to do and the way those decisions get made if you're in business, if you're in government, if you're in, in, um, in anything having to do with operations with, with, with this is, is looking at the benefits and comparing them to the costs. <clears throat> and the problem we have <clears throat> is we can do a great job at the costs. Any of you with a little bit of time could tell me the cost to run a Coliseum, the cost to run a museum, the cost to run a... We know what it costs. But what's the benefit? What's the value of these places? <clears throat> um, 
I just put these up just to illustrate some of the some of the complications. The, the problem is that we have identified a range of different types of value that are appropriate in the cultural world. Break that into two buckets: instrumental values and intrinsic values. Instrumental values. First of them is use value. What's the use value of a, of a um, building? It's basically what you can rent it for. Um, can, I, can I use this building in today's world or something? There is an option value. The option value is how much would you be willing to pay in order to have the option to do something in the future. I really want to go to Italy. I haven't done it yet, but I'm willing to pay something to make sure Italy doesn't disappear. There's an existence value. The concept of an existence value is I may never get there, but I'm still willing to pay something to know that it exists. The most interesting test of the existence value theory in our recent times is the bombing on Buddhas. When the Taliban want to threaten to blow them up, they approach the UN and say, if you pay us enough money, you won't blow them up. We're testing the existence value to the world of the bombing on Buddha. As it happened, there was no one in the UN who had anything like the amount of money they wanted, so they blew them up. But that was, that was strictly a test of how much would you all be willing to pay as human beings to know the bombing and people who are still So that's the concept of existence value. There is something called a bequest value. How, how much would you be willing to pay to have something exist for your offspring or future generations, even if you're never going to get there yourself? And instrumental values can include externalities that you can count. The educational value of museums, um, the, the family, the social cohesion that comes from, from museums, um, uh, nationalism, patriotism that may come from preserving important historical sites. All these kind of things are arguably beneficial values which could go into this benefit cost calculus if we could figure out how to measure it. Then there's a whole class of values that economists have identified called intrinsic values. These are really tough. This is the aesthetic value of something. You know, the, the, the core of church in Istanbul. Fabulous mosaics, uh, beautiful place, aesthetically valuable. Spiritual value, you know, um, churches, uh, Ayers Rock, in Australia, right? For the indigenous population in Australia, it's a, it's a fundamental spiritual place. It also has a use value to tourists. They like to go out and climb. Creates some tension. It's a value clash, right? Between, between the aboriginals who say, no, that's our sacred place, and the rock climbers who say that's our sacred rock climbing target. Well, in Australia, the Aboriginals won, and this year they banned climbing uh, Uluru, or banned climbing Earth Rock. It took a long time. Um, but you've got, you've got different values in there, none of which are really entirely measurable, some of which are not measurable at all. Um, social value, historic value, symbolic value, authenticity value. Um, uh, David Throsby, who's a leading cultural economist, calls all of these cultural values. They're intrinsic to the things. They matter to societies. They're all relative. It all depends on who you are and where you are and what your context is as to what's valuable to you and what's not on this scale. There's people who say they have also health value. Who's right? And there's a new, I don't know, uh, theory who says after visiting a museum, or visiting an historic site or archaeological site, your health gets slightly better. Oh, no, absolutely. There's a, there are the Japanese have done studies on 
um, visits to parks and zoos. Um, um, and there absolutely are externalities that are completely counterintuitive um, in, the, in the present day context, like people appear to be happier and healthier after they have done something outdoors. Not only. I think it's Norway, I don't remember exactly, that doctors are starting to uh, tell people us, I don't know, depression thing and so on, yeah. to go to museums yeah. because they have discovered that it has also helped. Wow. So one of the one of the areas of research in this whole field is to try to capture evidence of this in a scientifically credible way because there is a view that these health externalities are in fact important, uh, as are the educational externalities, as are the cultural externalities, etc. These are all values of cultural and archaeological and heritage activities. The problem is they're not easily quantified. The economists have some techniques. We, uh, uh, we do things um, called willingness to pay studies, where we will go out there. Basically, two categories of things you can do. You can do what's called a revealed preference study, and you can do uh, what's called a stated preference study. A stated preference study is where I go out and ask you what something's worth to you. So contingent valuation studies lay out scenarios that describe a situation and then try to ask you how much would you be willing to pay for this to happen, that's willingness to pay, or for it not to happen, that's willingness to avoid. And there's a whole set of rules that have been set up by the economists about how to do these kind of studies properly, but it's, it's a way to extract from people uh, what I'm asked to a demand curve. How much, of, how much museum are you willing to pay for if it has this benefit? How much conservation of these buildings are you willing to pay for if it looks like this afterwards, et cetera? And those kinds of studies get done not a lot, but they do get done. A lot of, a lot, there's a lot of Italian cultural economists who work in this area. Um, the other type of study is what's called a, um, a, a reveal preference study where I don't ask you what you want, because people are notoriously, you know, don't know why or, or whatever. I mean, asking people what they want is not always considered a gold standard for finding out what they want. So there are studies, for example, travel cost studies. The best estimate of what a trip to New York City is worth for you from Italy is how much you spend on it. How much you spend on the airfare, how much you spend on the hotel, how much you spend on the restaurants, how much you spend on everything else. And so there are studies done that try to accumulate how much people spend when they go from one place to another and try to project from that the value of the place. I, I teach a study that was done of three Civil War battlefields that looked at the travel cost of all the people who went to the battlefields and compared it to the operating cost of the battlefields. And projected, they projected the visitors they interviewed out to the entire visitor population and came up with a value for two of the battlefields that said it's worth more than it costs, and one that wasn't. Which would then take me to the question of should I shut down the other battlefield and turn it into a parking lot? Um, you know, but that, that kind of technique exists. It has a lot of problems. All of these techniques have enormous numbers of technical problems. The most obvious one is if you're measuring how much something is worth based on their travel, the, the site next door is worth a whole lot than the site across the country. A whole lot less than the site across the country. So nearby places get undervalued. Free places get undervalued. A museum that costs you $25 to get in is worth more on this technique than one that's free. Um, so there's a ton of technical problems that economists haven't really sorted out as to how to value it, but they're, still, they're grappling with this issue of is there any way to capture in some fashion the, um, the, both the intrinsic and the instrumental values in a way that I can make the case that it's 
worth doing what I want to do. So if you go look at Cultural Heritage Counts for Europe, for example, they have looked at job creation, they have looked at macroeconomic studies, there are techniques that are basically relevant of God, Russia's God's plan uh, for trying to figure out the impact on a local economy, of spending on a project, I'm going to build a new museum, uh, it's going to inject this much money into the economy, that's going to spin off so many new jobs and so much more GDP and so much more taxes. And so that benefit exceeds the cost, and therefore it's a good thing to do. Another technique with lots of holes, but they get used all the time. Always what the economists are doing is they're trying to solve this problem of what's the value of activities <coughs> that have no market. The market's failed. There's no clean market, competitive market for museums or archaeological sites. And I have to make choices because money is scarce, and I have to decide what I'm going to do and what I'm not, and I need a benefit to compare to the cost. So this, um, this process of recognizing the market has value, it just doesn't always work. Where the market works, it can tell you lots. Prices can give you great information. Where it doesn't work, you now have this problem in today's world of scarce resources, government cutbacks, changing attitudes, um, that something has to be done. So what I want to do is, maybe I'll stop there for a minute before I go into examples of how this works in the world and see how much I've confused you all. Is there any question? Hmm? I ask if there's any questions. <laughs> Professor Good talked a couple of times about a report, which you can find in the internet. It's very easy to find. Yeah. Cultural heritage counts for Europe. If you look at this in the internet, you will find the PDF very quickly. And it's a really interesting thing to see how this project evaluates the value that cultural heritage can be given in Europe, which is some of, one of the problems That's that we really generally have. Right. How, why do I have to give you money for this? How much impact will this have on our society? See, this word impact, we're going to come back to this, the word impact is, is not only resonating all through the halls of government, Tell me, tell, me, tell me how much of a difference you make. Tell me how you're going to improve society. Tell me how you are more important than public housing. Um, and that issue is there. The other thing that's happening is philanthropy is beginning, and this is particularly true in the United States, but it's going to spread. Um, philanthropy is asking the question, where can I have the most bang for the buck? If I want to fix the world, and this is these billionaires who are you know, doling it out you know, in, in 100, 200, and 300 million dollar chunks, um, are saying, I've got a lot of money, I can make a big difference in the world, why do I want to put it into a museum wing if I can put it into solving some disease? There's a whole ethical school uh, that's cropped up around this. Uh, called effective. Um, um, uh, in altruism, effective altruism, um, and um, uh, but the the issue of impact. Prove to me that the impact of what you're doing is the most efficient way to get to the goal I want. Has the most bang for the buck is really critical to how philanthropists think. And what this study is all about is it's all about how governments think. So it's all about economics driving heritage decisions. And what are, impact doesn't always have to be economic. It can be also on health, on culture, on democracy, on education, yeah. on, on, on everything practically. But maybe in Italy it's not so neat now, but I know, for example, in the UK and also in Spain, for example, each time you ask for a project or you make a and asking for funding or anything, the most important thing that you have to feel is how is this research going to have an impact in present 
and let's say to tomorrow's right. uh, future. So it's something that you have to start thinking about. And it's not economically only, which can also be very important, but also in other things. I wanted to make you an, a question. Yeah. Uh, you talk a lot about um, the governments and how governments are thinking about uh, how much value or how much this costs and how I invest and so on. You're talking probably about Anglo-Saxon governments because do you think, and you know a lot about the Italian government, do you think that the Italian government has any interest on evaluating these things or is more about political and corruption and relationships and so on? <laughs> I mean, do you think when they give money, they are thinking about this? You know, the, 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 my answer to that would be, if you look at what they're doing with the museums, Herculaneum, Pompeii, the National Museums, you know, um, um, there are these attempts to find another model, which not only, I, I, I infer from all those attempts, there's an attempt to find a way to be more efficient, spend money more wisely, not have to spend as much. And there's a recognition that all these other problems exist, which is well known, and somehow getting it outside of a bureaucracy into a, a, a less government bureaucratized context will bring some of these elements of comp competition in, will make them more efficient as businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Now, are they very good at this? The track record so far says no. But, and, and is it universal? It's absolutely not. But, um, you know, even in Italy, <clears throat> if you will, I would argue that there's a recognition in the government that these issues have to be dealt with. Um, in Britain, it's religion now. They're going to privatize everything they can. In the United States, it's a given. Uh, in much of the rest of the Europe, people are experimenting different ways. Latin America is still reasonably centralized. Um, Africa's feeling its way and everything. India, I mean, Asia, China is very, China is highly decentralized in its structure, but it's all government. Um, so the models are varied all over the world. And do you think there is just these two ways? Government or privatization? Or there is no, not I, think a fair it's, I think it's a continuum. Um, where you can have various solutions. The problem is each model has serious difficulties, right? The, the private sector model, um, if the market doesn't work, it's, you know, you, if, if a museum should exist and you spin it off as a museum, as a private entity, and you don't have a philanthropic backstop, which nobody except the United States really has, um, then it's going to fail. And then everybody said, well, well, why did that museum die? Well, it died because nobody was paying for it, right? So until you have a, a, either a funding alternative or a, a, some sort of funding alternative to enable heritage organizations, cultural organizations to survive without government subsidy, then if you just spin them off and say the private market will solve it, that basically says they're going to die. And in most of the world, that's true because the United States is close to unique, except for the Brits, in the, in the volume of activity that's funded by, by private philanthropy. Now, the, the point of this first slide is I want to walk you through how some of this applies in the real world. One of the things that we have to do, apropos of this question, is you've got to learn how to run these things like businesses. That doesn't mean they're going to work as private sector activities, but when you're in the operation, when you're managing the archaeological park, when you're managing the museum, you, you want to be asking yourself business-like questions. Yeah. If you're going to set prices of admission, you need to worry about the elasticity of demand. If you are in a situation where your costs are rising, but you're not able to, to you, you don't think you're able to restructure yourself to reduce them, you have to recognize that you're eventually going to, you know, go negative if you don't either stop the cost increase, which is often not practical because people need to be paid to live, or you don't restructure your operation so you become, become more productive, get more 
you know, fewer people to get the job done or more good value job out of the people you've got. Um, businesses are very good at managing costs because they exist to make a profit. They're very good at figuring out where to set their prices so they demand goes up, not down. Um, and not-for-profit entities have a hard time with that, and government entities are terrible. But in the real world, if this is going to continue as a viable sector in the economy, the cultural heritage world has got to begin to think of itself as a business and where it can, where it's appropriate, which is largely at the level of today's costs, today's revenues, things like that. It needs to run like a business and not be ashamed of that. Um, the other thing that we need to focus on is that cultural heritage is absolutely at the core of the tourism industry, which is the biggest service industry in the world, as I said. And we shouldn't be ashamed of that either, because without the tourism industry, the, the most tangible reason governments support their cultural heritage is because tourists are coming to see it. There's plenty of data that says that even in places like the United States, where at least as an American it's counterintuitive because I don't think of us as having much history, um, um, phenomenal numbers of people who come to the United States do go to a museum or do go to a heritage site or do go to some kind of cultural event. Um, so underneath the, the economics of the entire sector we're in is the, is the tourism industry. And, and that, from the point of view of, um, of how we think about it, you know, you have to realize tourism is a source of foreign investment for most countries in the world. Um, it's a source of foreign exchange. When, you know, when I come to Italy and start spending my, my dollars over here, I'm essentially um, uh, providing Italy with an export which is exporting its services to me, because I'm buying them in dollars. And that is extreme, increasing your foreign exchange, it's helping your currency value, and it's creating economic activity. If you're in a country like Belize, where one third of the GDP comes from tourism, uh, Cambodia, where 28% you know, of the people in one study who went to Cambodia only went because of Angkor Wat. Um, you, know, you have places that are literally, the economies would collapse. And if you doubt that, you can look at what happened in Egypt after the Arab Spring when the, the visitor numbers plummeted because people were afraid they'd get kidnapped or killed, and the economy really took a tremendous suck. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the importance of tourism as the rationale for, um, for doing all this is critical. Lots of jobs, and many of these developing countries, lots and lots and lots of jobs. Are, are coming um, from the tourism industry. So we have to realize that, that that's all true. We also have to recognize that much urban development and much of the strategy of cities today is driven by the view of the value they can extract from their heritage. There is a, there's a concept uh, uh, called the creative city that's been floating around for a number of years. The basic idea is if cities are going to prosper, they have to have living in them, essentially people like you, who are young, trained, you know, energetic, interested in being there, and the way to get those people there is to get the companies there who want to employ them, and the way you do that is you make sure the city can provide the amenities people want. That's everything from good restaurants and good housing to good museums and neighborhoods that are charming, like the one you're in. You know, that's a place you'd like to live because it's kind of cool and maybe you've got great bars and nightlife and things like that. All of that is part of bringing cities back to life in much of the world. And the core of that in any city that's got heritage turns out to be its stock of heritage buildings and how they can be completely deployed. So again, we're back into economic decisions. What are we going to invest in? How are we going to regulate it? How are we going to manage this stock of heritage? Is it all going to be done through government regulation or is it going to be done through private sector activity? The same issues come up, but cities are being driven extremely rapidly and completely by, by this. And 
takes us to the philanthropic point. At the end of the day, we're not going to be able to finance this stuff and have anything sustainable until we've dealt with how do we sell all of these, how do we answer these value questions, convince the philanthropists, convince the government people that, um, that we have a story to tell that's worth the money. And at the same time, people have to come back, uh, the, the, the populace has to come around to the view that it's okay to think this way. Um, you know, I think everybody was deathly afraid that's what was going to happen to the Coliseum, right? <laughs> they were just going to stick their name in the bottom and, you know, let everybody see it from the air. They certainly wanted to put their name on the back of the ticket. Um, you know, in America, if, ta if somebody come in and said, I'll give you 25 million bucks and I want to buy the back of your ticket for five years, that wouldn't even have been a hard decision. I mean, that would have been, you bet. You know, how about 50 million for 10 years? Um, um, the response was very different here. That's a cultural thing. It partly stems from the fact that historically the government's done all this. But if the government doesn't want to do it and can't do it anymore, then we're going to have to think about how do we lure these folks in? How do we in induce them to want to, um, to support the activities we're doing? We go to 12 or 12.30? 12 12.15. 12 OK. So um, the moral of this story is there is a lot of value in, in what you can get out of economics and how you can apply it. Uh, I, I sent you Randy Mason's piece, right? I mean, it's still one of the best pieces ever done on this. And Mason, Mason makes five, finds five positives about economics. One is it's, it's about more than markets and profit seeking. It's about how well-being is produced, distributed, and consumed how these big social decisions get made. It can lead to better and more sustainable decisions, the business point. It can help build political support. People in government think the way I'm talking. If we're going to get government people to support us, we have to be able to talk to them in their language, or at least help them understand the limitations of their language and begin to see things through their eyes into our view of the world. It gives a very useful lens on preferences and how they're sorted out because different countries have different priorities, different people have different priorities, and figuring out what should be done, you know, an economic lens is one of the lenses you can use to look at it. And he argues that it's a way economics is a tool for ensuring the social relevance of, uh, of conservation and, and, and heritage. But he does make two key points, which I completely agree with. One is that approaches that deal strictly with the market do a very bad job of dealing with externalities and market failure. And we are living in a sector where externalities and market failure are the norm. So you can't solve these problems just with a market answer. And the other is that markets are not really designed to answer long-term questions. The purpose of a market is to decide how much that iPhone should sell for today and get the prices and costs lined up. I don't need to pick on your iPhone. Um, pick on people. Um, we don't ask questions very often about today except for things like what's the price of admission to the museum or how much am I going to pay a curator or how much should I be willing to spend on this, this exhibit. The core questions we ask are, how many centuries should we be preserving the Colosseum for? You know, how many, how many, uh, you know, how many decades should this conservation job of this painting last? You know, you know, do we want to have Stonehenge around in 3,000? Those are not questions markets are very good at answering. Uh, it's not even clear how you even begin to approach value-based questions. And so economics has distinct limitations when we get to a lot of the sort of core underlying issues. But in a world where money's scarce, those issues will tend to get swept aside unless we can deal with that. Now, I sent around the thing on, um, on the Yenna Coffee Shipyard. I thought it might be a good way, a good basis for discussion if you have time to read it. Um, this, is, this is the Yenna Coffee Shipyard. Um, uh, five years ago, I think. Um, and just sort of 
refresh, refresh your memory, uh, refresh your memory. The Turkish government is building a subway system that's going to link the Asian part and the European part and you know, create a massively more efficient Istanbul. All of you know what the Anikapi is? Is there somebody who doesn't know where it is and so on? Trienani, the best in Saberlo, but you don't know what Everybody knows who is the Anikapi? Can you rise your hand who does know? Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, that happened. So, Yenikapi was supposed, this was supposed to be the, uh, the, the Stazione Centrale for, uh, for, uh, for Istanbul for their subway system. They did an archaeological survey, said, good site, nothing there. Um, the tubes, up in the far right-hand corner, you can see the, the two tubes of the subway lines coming in. When they came in, they started to hit potsherds. When they got done, they had excavated this entire space by hand. Um, they had uncovered Roman docks, there's one way in the back you can't really see, but it's back there, it's a marble dock. Byzantine docks, 30 some Byzantine and Roman wooden boats, more than had been found in all of history, basically, anywhere. They found that many in one place. 88,000 cases of pots and potsherds. Uh, they held up the project for 10 years, roughly. As they were about to finish, about year eight, some archaeologist said, well, can I just go look over in this corner just, just for fun? And he dug for a little while and he found a Neolithic village. So they spent another two years excavating the Neolithic village. Um, Bertigan was the prime minister by the time this was finished. He was rabid because this was costing the government a fortune in direct costs and indirect costs, what are called opportunity costs to economists. That is, the, all the people who couldn't get to work efficiently because this wasn't running were spending more money and more time that was a waste. So it raises some enormous questions like, how much archaeology is enough? You know, when do you stop? These are questions archaeologists don't like to ask, but if you're the prime minister of Turkey and you've got a 10-year delay on your Grand Central Station and you're spending billions and billions of, of Turkish uh, lira on, on collecting crates of pots that probably no one will ever look at and, and unearthing boats, which now that they've been unearthed have to be you know, kept wet and then treated and then stored. And then maybe you've got to build a couple of museums for this stuff that you don't have the money for. And you go rattle on, on and on down the list and you say to yourself, oh my God, why, why, why are we doing this, right? Why are they doing that? <laughs> what should they do? When do you stop? Those are my questions. I'm done. <laughs> from, from an archaeological point of view, it's the most important harbor that has ever been found in the Mediterranean. Yeah. I mean, all the, in all the places, I would say, well, I'm not sure. But in this case, it's extraordinary. So but those, it puts, so those, those, and so forth. But it puts the issue squarely on the table. When do you stop? How much should we pay for archaeology? How much archaeology should we get? Should we really? I mean, I mean, uh, Shadow Hall told me uh, yesterday, he, he was there after I was, and by the time he was there, they were reburying the 88,000 crates of pots on the other side of the dock. I mean, you know, you've, you've gone through this enormous trouble to collect all this stuff, and they simply can't process it. The, the carry-through costs of these boats is phenomenal. Yes, there's more than anyone's ever found. Are there too many? It's an interesting question for museums. Do we need all the stuff that's in museums? We did an exhibit at the Penn Museum a few years ago of Chinese mummies. Um, we did it in conjunction with the Huntington Museum in California, and when they negotiated the contract with the Chinese, they screwed up. And as the mummies arrived at Penn, the Chinese said, well, actually, they're due back in China. And we said, well, wait a minute, we got this whole exhibit thing set up. They wouldn't let us open the crates for a month while we argued over this. We have some very talented folks at the Penn Museum who are very good among them, because we have lots of mummies. We have a guy whose hobby is making mummies. So he made copies of all the mummies. So we ran the exhibit for a month with fake mummies, photographs of the, of the, of the stuff we couldn't get out of the cases, and, and put up the whole rest of the exhibit with essentially a completely fake core holding. And nobody cared. 
People came, they enjoyed it. We, we told them what it was. We said, you know, this, this isn't the real thing. And astonishingly, nobody cared. Uh, and so you begin to ask yourself, well, do I really need all this stuff? Do I really need to spend all this money on, on conserving and preserving artifacts? How many, how, many, uh, how many do I need? How many Maya pots do I really need and which ones? When you're, when you're running a museum and your costs are going up and someone says I need a $10 million building just to put you know, air conditioning in to hold all the pots that nobody's looked at in the last 20 years, you start to wrestle with questions like that. That's economics.